Roger Ford of the National Hemp Growers Cooperative, thank you so much for being with us on Hemp Barons today. Joel, it's a pleasure being with you. Man, am I ever a fan and a cheerleader for things going on at the National Hemp Growers Cooperative. Boy, hemp needs the leadership and experience of the National Hemp Growers Cooperative like the flower needs the rain and the sun, man. Um, and of course, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm so excited about it that I'm involved in some of these projects, including the one that we're about to talk about today. And it's such an honor and a pleasure uh, to be involved. But Roger, you are the founding board member, founding board member of the National Hemp Growers Cooperative, as well as the president of Eureka Energy Corporation. Having said that, the incredible experience um, and breadth of experience and skills and talent that you bring to the co-op and thus the emerging hemp industries is tremendous. Please elaborate um, for our listeners a little bit, and I and we could go on for a half an hour about it, but a little bit about that tremendous experience that you bring. Yeah, so I, 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 I wear many hats, uh, but two of the many hats that I wear, one is uh, I am the president of Eureka Energy Corporation, of which Nick Walters, one of my other longtime uh, friends and, and actually partners in the cooperatives founding, actually is involved with Eureka Energy, as is Max Howe and some other folks in, in Eureka. But Eureka was organized in 2017 as a for-profit corporation. We were incorporated in Wyoming. Uh, and that's, even though I'm in Kentucky, that that makes good business sense for these types of companies to be located and registered as a corporation in Wyoming. The purpose of Eureka is we're white hot focused on the development of projects around the use of biomass. And it seems a lot of times biomass gets left out of the conversation when we're talking about energy. And I'm, I'm an all of the above energy guy. I believe we should st be good stewards of, of our resources. And if it makes sense to use it, we ought to be doing it. I mean, it's, you know, I have no, uh, I have as little problem with the use of coal as I do with solar or wind or whatever. But my interest is, is is really having grown up in a rural part of the country in Kentucky, the use of, as I'm sitting here right now looking out, the use of biomass and what potentially can we do with that. And, and we as a company think that this is the, a huge missing component that helps not just the United States, but other countries as well by producing either solid fuel such as wood pellets, you know, wood pellets or, 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 biomass pellets or 100% charcoal, or as what we plan on doing, processing this biomass and whatever that biomass may be. And we will talk a little bit about that, but whether that's trees or agricultural crops or bio waste, such as municipal waste or sewer sludge or food waste or whatever, it's all organic and it all has at some level, a, a component we, we know is methane. Methane is basically what we would recognize traditionally as, uh, as natural gas. Uh, if it's derived from biomass, it's considered renewable natural gas. And so what we want to do as a company is uh, develop projects around the use in rural areas. So we do rural economic development, which we sorely need in this country. Uh, to rebuild a lot of lost manufacturing. I think this is a way that we do that it is by taking what's available in these rural areas and processing that and adding value to that in the form of RNG and then converting that RNG to an energy product. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there because I want to really lay a foundation for my listeners and we're already using acronyms that my listeners, most of them don't know. So, okay. but but I want to, and which is, and this is great. We were just going to lay that foundation. And, and I also just want to, again, highlight that you come from a major background of, of bioenergy, biofuels. You have been interested in hemp and, and researching and kicking these tires, so to speak, since for a little over a decade. And in fact, yeah. you know, we're the, was the first corporate permit holder for a hemp processing and growing license in southeastern Kentucky, you know, way back uh, when when the agricultural um, 
pilot programs first came about. So the, this is just incredible. And of course, your experience with legislation um, and at uh, the Kentucky General Assembly and, and so much. I could just go on and on. But let's Let's uh, lay a foundation for the listeners as we, because I want them to know when we use these acronyms what we're talking about. And and folks, this is a is a show about hemp or a podcast an interview about hemp and renewable natural gas and the tremendous economic stability that we can provide our farmers while also providing environmental stability. Um, and this is a, a huge market, I think, in an economic economic driver and a job creator of fairly epic proportions. But as we start, in layman's terms, please tell us what is RNG and what does it mean? RNG basically is natural gas or methane that is derived from a renewable source. Awesome. Renewable natural gas. Yeah. So it's basically methane that is not coming out of the traditional path of you know as we as we understand is where you drill for it and it, it come you know you pull it out of the ground right you it, you drill it and create a gas well uh, out of the strata of the rock right uh, this is basically the same thing as that except it is from uh, existing biomass so anything that that grows uh, and decays that's organic, will will produce methane garbage garbage food waste uh, crops all that right i mean you know you you can derive methane in the right conditions from all this and so when we talk about rng it is recognized as being from a renewable source landfill gas landfill methane uh, gas is is considered rng you can burn it it will burn just like natural gas. Uh, it can be uh, blended with natural gas in, in the pipeline uh, as long as it meets that, that spec and requirement to do that. Uh, you, and so you have existing infrastructure already in place. So it, this is not requiring that we change a lot of what we have in place right now in terms of energy infrastructure to manage the production of RNG because it is readily blendable with renewable gas. Um, I mean, and with na- and regular uh, natural gas. So RNG is simply the acronym that you would describe methane gas that's derived from biomass. So awesome. So we are going to say RNG a lot in this interview, guys. Renewable natural gas, and you just learned from the pro, uh, the, the breadth and body of, uh, of renewable natural gas. Now, before we get into another acronym, GTL, can you explain to the listeners what gasification is and what pyrolysis is? Gasification is uh, a process you're basically taking uh, the material and there's there's different ways to gasify. So we understand anaerobic digestion, right? Where you're anaerobic being without oxygen. Okay, so gasification doesn't necessarily mean without oxygen to that, that in that process. So the uh, definition of pyrolysis is basically you're gasifying by heat and releasing the methane uh, from material without oxygen, okay? So uh, there is a heat element involved in that uh, with pyrolysis. There doesn't necessarily have to be, with gasification, generally heat involved in the process of generating that, that gas. So one may or may not have oxygen present, and the other one, pyrolysis is not going to have oxygen present. I mean, that's basically the the difference in those. And then you get into different types of gasification. Uh, you're you're talking about anaerobic digestion, where you're basically using a bacteria or a yeast to get a particular result. Right? You can do that to produce ethanol, or you get it to produce methane uh, from from that. But it all depends on what those microbes are, what those bacteria are that that you add to the organic material is going to give you a certain result in that. But 
to understand gasification with or without oxygen is gasification. Pyrolysis is all the time without oxygen. And anaerobic digestion is without oxygen. Anaerobic. So essentially, the technology, the revolutionary earth-changing technology that is licensed to Eureka Energy Corporation is a form, a very unique and innovative form of gasification. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, yeah. And it, it is proprietary. I mean, I, we can't talk a lot about it, but I can say it's water-based which is kind of unique. Totally. Uh, it, does not in, it does not involve a lot of heat, meaning that there's not a direct correlation to heat to, to release the, 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 the methane gas. Uh, we're speeding up the process of anaerobic digestion. This is the uniqueness of it uh, in, in that uh we degrade the uh, organic material uh, and create a slurry that we then uh, process, you know, and take it through uh, that, that process to capture the gas off of it. So anaerobic digestion takes a, a longer timeline. We're speeding that. That's the uniqueness of what our process, what, what we have to deploy as a technology is that we speed that process up. So anaerobic digestion to get to 100% efficiency will take months to do that. This takes a matter of days and weeks. So, the, yeah, so we're able to process a lot of material a lot quicker. And with when we're talking about not having to have these excessive temperatures, we're also talking about, you know, not creating a huge carbon footprint there either. The more we heat, the more we need to heat, the higher our carbon footprint becomes. That's, that's right. And you, yeah, and, and it's, an, it's an energy input. Uh, what makes ethanol and a lot of the uh, production, a lot of these things not efficient, meaning it costs us more to produce than you derive in profit from it is that there's a lot of energy goes into the process of producing this. Uh, that's not the case for what we're talking about. So ours is a low, a low energy consumer uh, process. Uh, so we're able to have a smaller footprint as far as the carbon footprint. The facilities are not large because they don't have to be because by design. We, we can have a fairly substantial operation on, on less than 50 acres uh, of land. So that, this is a, you know, uh, very adaptable to different settings, whether it's urban or rural. Uh, so the idea is that, that you're able to process multi, multiple feedstock within a defined area. And our technology can easily handle between 300 tons a day to 7,000 tons a day. So they're, they're, they're adaptable to location and, and feedstock availability, and they're adaptable to the amount of volume of that feedstock. So th those are all positives for us uh, as far as a company because not all locations are going to be the same. This is not a cookie cutter approach. The technology is cookie cutter, but it's very adaptable and very flexible. So we'll get to that. But just to understand that we are not a huge consumer of energy by design. And, and it sounds to me, um, not only is this process not a huge consumer of energy, if we compare it, and I'd, I'd love for you to elaborate on this, Roger, if we compare it to landfill gas and we look at, because that's a, you know, that's a, hey, that's a viable solution. It's not as incredible of a solution as this technology, but it's a viable solution. And we've got a lot of that going on here in Washington state. Can't wait to improve upon that process, but that for landfill gas and goodness knows it's a wonderful thing that we're taking garbage and turning it into energy, but we're still having to go through the process of that garbage being taken to the landfill, human beings separating out the metals and glass and plastics from the bio garbage and then that and that takes human beings to do etc and then that going into the process um to create that gas tell us how this in addition to being low energy input 
how this process with this unique technology is different from the tremendous labor intensive process that I just described for landfill gas. Well, number one, yeah, so landfill gas, I mean, so you have to put a lot of garbage in the ground and you have to cover that up and you have to wait for years to derive any benefit from landfill methane gas. I mean, it. Boy, I totally skipped that major piece. Yeah. I mean, so with this, we can process organic waste, any organic waste, whether that be sewer waste or municipal solid waste, garbage, construction demolition material that, you know, wood and other organics that, that are in that space, things that are right now going in the landfill. So at the end of the day, waste processing and conversion to usable energy is part of our, part of our business strategy, which means that there's less material going into landfills. Because that material could essentially be delivered right to one of these sites. Yeah, you're 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 diverting it from the landfill and taking it to one of these facilities, and not burying it in the ground and waiting years. And waiting years, and 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 you don't know what people put in their garbage at the curb. I mean, they tell you not to put oil cans and paint cans and all, and you know that's happening, right? I mean, it's just it's just happening, and and that that creates a very toxic mess in a landfill that maybe 50 years from now is going to have to be dealt with as a super site cleanup. I mean, it, it, there's lots of negatives to landfilling waste. If we can remove a portion of that first by taking all of the organics out of that ton of garbage and taking it through our process, then that's, that helps us do that. And in the process, the way we separate that is not labor intensive. Amen. So Let's we're go. not going to, yeah, it's a water-based separation. So we're able to isolate the inerts, the glass, metal, and plastic. And obviously that's going to come off the process. And all that we're left with is those organics, uh, the, the biomass in that water solution. Then we pull those over and those become recyclable. So we're byproducts that we can do other other value added with. So there's a very small percentage of material that would go to a landfill, if any, in what we're proposing to do. Uh, so this is a paradigm shift, as I call it, in our thinking that we we don't have to have the landfill space that we once had. And we can capture that landfill gas at the same time to um, also bring over to one of these facilities and produce that gas. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing keeping the, the methane from the years buried whole garbage that created that methane uh, from the landfill. Nothing wrong with taking that. Absolutely. But the bottom line is can eliminate that process. Um, that's right. And, you know, and, and, and that's that's the that's not to knock the waste, the waste management industry in any way, but at some point we have to, we have to think differently about how we do this. And I know there's lots of municipalities and lots of states are beginning to say, you can't put food waste in landfills. You have to do something with it, but you're not going to put it in a landfill. Here in Seattle, you get dinged if your compost is not in your compost. And that's... I think Boston, but maybe it's Boston is also. But I mean, and there's big money in the, obviously, in landfill and garbage. It's pretty simple, right? <laughs> We're like a bunch of cats running around the countryside, covering up our waste. I mean, it's, that's the analogy. And that's a, that's a messy business uh, all the way around. So we, we need to think smarter about our, our waste of how, you know, and we're a wasteful country in a lot of ways. Uh, we need to conserve more. And this is one way that we do it. We, we take those waste streams and process into usefulness. And I don't think there's a, politically, I don't think there's any left or right to that conversation. Uh, you're conserving and you're not wasting and you're creating value and you're doing things that in the process, help the environment. So I don't see that there's a 
a huge downside. We just have to rethink how we do that. This and this is what you're explaining, of course, is something we can absolutely all agree on. Let- yeah, right. I mean, it's it's it, it's a bridge the divide. This, I think, is something we can all agree on. Absolutely. Ten times over. And we see a, a lot of that in in hemp. Yeah, I mean seriously. I mean it, it. It's it's conserving. It's not wasting, it, and it's taking our things that are undesirable in our environment and making something useful out of it that we can benefit from. So, Amen. And then let me ask you this before we go on to the last uh, acronym that I wanted to explain. When you say, of course, that these sites are not cookie cutter, that they're adaptable. Um, you know, I one of the pieces of the of the puzzle here, or of the the intention for Eureka and National Hemp Growers Cooperative, is of course we would use garbage, essentially bio garbage, is I guess a, the term I'm using. Um, and you'll you'll correct me if that's just a crazy term to be using, but bio garbage, and because the inerts are separated from it, as well as I would call ag waste, but in terms of adaptability local to where the site is. So of course, where you are, uh, well, you're in Kentucky, but when we're talking about Mississippi, which is where I know this first uh, facility uh, is going to go in, that's big poultry company country there. So we're talking, you know, chicken feathers and bones and guts and all of that kind of ag waste. Well, up here in Washington, we have a tremendous need for this facility. Uh, we have Boeing here, we have airports, everybody's got airports, but uh, we have a huge need for renewable natural gas here in Washington. Washington, but we're not poultry country. We're we're apple country. We're hops country. So the bottom line is that the recipe, as it were, can be adapted to wherever, whatever the local agricultural waste is. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, that's that's how we see this thing developing. You know, so in Kentucky, uh, you know, you have uh, obviously we have a lot of horses, but the uh, you know the mix of what that would look like here is going to be completely different than what it is in Washington state or in Mississippi. And so, you know, we do have poultry farms here. We do have cattle, we do have horses and, and all that, you know, we do, but we do have a lot of corn, soybean, you know, uh, farming that goes on. I mean, there's, and, and municipal waste, right? I mean, we, we don't, uh, especially in rural areas, that is a huge concern uh, of how we properly manage our waste. So this is a solution for rural municipalities to rethink how they're doing their doing their waste disposal, and we could probably do that cheaper than what they're doing right now. So you're saving the municipality. I mean, and but it is adaptable. Back to your point is. Uh, what it would look like in Washington state may be visually on the outside is the same, but the inputs are going to be different. Uh, and that's the beauty of this technology is that we come up with that right ratio, the recipe uh, of this blend of material to maximize the amount of gas that we produce. That That's the key. Totally the key. And what about, Roger, the capacity? As we talk about the adaptability, what are we thinking of the capacity? Maybe it boils down to barrels of natural, renewable natural gas a day uh, of, of these facilities. Um, so understanding there's two technologies at work here. So what we would produce in terms of natural gas would be uh, described in uh cubic feet of gas. Uh-huh. So to process that into and translate that into a barrel of oil, we have to have a million cubic feet of gas for for every 100 barrels of bio crude. So a 10 million cubic feet daily gets us to a thousand barrels. And that's what we're planning in Mississippi. We're planning to produce 10 million cubic feet of gas on demand today to get us to basically a thousand barrels or 42,000 gallons or 42,000 gallons. Yes. Barrels are either 55 or 42. So there's a short barrel and a, and then a, a, the long barrel. So the, 
So the 42, 42 gallons in a short, that's what we would be producing. Now, to put that in perspective, let's talk about some stats of the average amount of gallons or barrels, however you want to describe to us now that we've got the, we're looking at these facilities producing 1,000 barrels or somewhere around 42,000 gallons a day. Give us a stat, whether it's a single airline in a single day or something to help us put into perspective how much just one something uses in gas per day in terms of barrels or gallons. Well, you know, thinking about there's there's two ways to go with it. First, I would I would mention that I guess I'm, I'm going to pick Seattle. Okay. I'm going to make an assumption that Seattle operates their municipal buses, transits, or maybe their school buses, but definitely their their city buses, do they they operate those on gas, right? Oh, some of them are connected to an electrical thing, but but a lot of these are gas. But I, I think a lot of them are and they run on natural gas so they run on right as uh, as as a alternative. That is CNG. That is compressed natural gas. We won't delve into that, but basically this gas that we would produce, RNG, could be put into those buses as compressed natural gas without pro- without processing it into a crude and then refining it into a diesel. Okay, so there, there may be a benefit for municipalities like Seattle or Portland or wherever to purchase, and I know this is a big business right now going into California, there's a lot of interest in that, and that's expanding. Uh, to basically use RNG in bus fleets and fleet vehicles like UPS or FedEx or whoever. All right, so that's one one direct path is to do that. But what we want to do is process the gas into transportation fuel, and we we want that because we've got a letter of intent to export this product to Europe. And what they want is bio crude. And this bio crude is basically just like crude oil for the most part. It's, it's, it's refinable. It's blendable with reg, you know, with traditional petroleum based crude. It, you, we can produce jet fuel. Uh, we can produce diesel and that's augmenting the catalyst. I mean, we can produce crude all day, but we could also say, at a facility, we want to just change that catalyst out and start producing diesel or we want to produce jet fuel. Yeah. And so in Washington state, actually, there was a huge contract announced by Delta out there uh, a couple years ago. Right. And they're using like 80 some million gallons of bio diesel, of bio jet fuel out there. So so there is a demand in, in Washington state for this type of product. And, and in other places, I mean, this is a growing demand. And if you're looking at what's happened in Europe and with the demands to reduce carbon emission in, in jet planes, this is going to be something that's going to stay with us because the world's going to demand it. And we have to adapt to that as, as, a, as a, American airlines are going to have to adapt to this new situation. Without a doubt. And and I know you're already seeing, or certainly Nick is already seeing, um, he's he's more down there in the Delta, uh, the pressure on the Mississippi River from the EPA. Yeah, that, that's actually something when we first organized, uh, when I first organized Eureka Energy, that was actually the driver for our development here in Kentucky, is we were looking to take this and build a network of, and we were going to take it straight to diesel and produce diesel for the barge traffic along the Mississippi River and sell that because they're getting some pressure to reduce their uh, sulfur emissions that goes into the water. So that was a driver for us as a company to, to develop these distributed facilities that would produce gas and convert that gas directly to diesel. And and that's still a potential market for us. It's huge. Yeah. So the Ohio River, the Missouri, the Mississippi, all of those that have a lot of barge traffic. So that's that's a potential market for us. 
for this fuel that we would produce. And, and while it's true that, you know, right now, not all of the 3.9 billion gallons of fuel that Delta uses every year annually are biodiesel or renewable, the trend of requiring this, whether it be our waterways or our airways, is only increasing and hopefully it's going to increase exponentially. So, and what I had try, tried to get to before and we got there is, uh, you know, produce a, a thousand barrels or 42,000 gallons a day at these sites. And we're looking at Delta alone requiring 3.9 billion gallons of, of fuel annually. This market is huge. This this opportunity is tremendous and it's a planetary healing opportunity. And so now, and by the way, I had neglected to get to our one last acronym before we move on to let's get the hemp back in here now, where this helps hemp, how this helps the hemp farmers and what the National Hemp Growers Cooperative, because it is just basically a two for three for the, the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, that may not be the, the most accurate way to say it, but what being a member of the National Hemp Growers Cooperative can do in this opportunity. But could we talk for a second on GTL, sir? Could you explain to us what GTL means? Gas to liquid. Simply uh, taking a gas, in this case methane, and taking it through a particular catalyst, whatever that is, maybe cobalt or something, but taking that, cab taking that gas through the catalyst through a process and that's a black box tech you know process but one that's in use sasol shell chevron they have all these you you listed some we were talking earlier uh sasol's been the one in south africa that's kind of the standard uh you know and and uh but yeah so and I know that I've worked on some of those in, in doing some research and development in, in previous uh, work. Um, those are all kind of based on coal gasification uh, that sets people's heads spinning. Uh, but gas to liquid is basically taking the gas derived from either coal or straight from a natural gas or other type of gas or biomass and converting that to a long chain hydrocarbon, which is basically oil in the sense of petroleum. For us, we're using biomass to gasify that and create the gas ourselves and then taking it that next step through the catalyst and this other technology to produce bio crude oil. And that bio crude then can be refined or we could have a different catalyst that gets us either diesel or jet fuel or a blend or a blending material for gasoline. So gas to liquid basically is the process taking it through a, the proper catalyst that creates a long chain hydrocarbon. And you can do it with other gases, but specifically methane, because methane is found in all resources because at the end of the day, plants creating coal and oil and gas at the end of it, over millions of years. Uh, so the idea is that we would put biomass in, in the mix of doing this uh, and then convert that gas to a liquid fuel. GTL wrapped up in a bow, people. Now let's talk about the recipe Talk about hemp in that recipe and National Hemp Growers Cooperative role and the opportunity here. Yeah, so the Hemp Growers Cooperative was, as I mentioned earlier, Nick Walters and Max Howell and myself uh, or have organized the National Hemp Growers Cooperative. It's based in Jackson, Mississippi, for the sole purpose of creating a national cooperative of hemp farmers and doing all the things that you would traditionally think that a cooperative does or would do uh, for a farmer. Uh, that's what its purpose is. We are amending that model just a little bit to create, because we've got this problem in the hemp sector, right, in the hemp industry, where we have so many promises 
but not a lot of actual bona fide results uh, on the back end for the farmer. So there's been a lot of that problem of where there's been lots of hope for, but not a lot of result. Mm -hmm. And so in my thinking uh, and how we would structure this, the idea is that we would create the end use, which is what Eureka Energy would be doing in order to give the farmer the contract and the assurance that, yes, there is a buyer. The unique thing is, is that we don't have to rely solely on hemp. We want to use hemp because it is an excellent input to generate that methane that we talked about. It it ranks at the very top of crops, along with wheat and you know wheat straw and all these other single use uh, energy crops like miscanthus or switchgrass. Hemp has versatility to generate a lot of methane per per ton. Um, and that's the Europeans are ahead of us in that research. But but looking at that research, uh, it, it produces a lot of methane per ton of hemp. And so wherever we're at, we want to include that. And by including that, that strengthens the this emerging industry that is hemp uh, in, in not the cannabinoid. I'm, I have no interest in any of that. I never have. Uh, I think this is where it's at because this gives you a higher value, a more stable. There's a market for this. All all of the reasons to not do extract type, you know, operations for for hemp. And I think too for hemp, in addition to being just a tremendously methane producing biomass, is. Of course, we're the farmer, especially after doing it for a couple of seasons, as long as proper agronomic, you know, practices are employed, can find that the hemp is actually helping to build the organic matter in the farmer's soil, increase yield for the crop that follows in the rotation. We're seeing a lot of those results. Uh, you know, help to break up the ground a little bit for water and, and all of with, with those incredibly deep tap roots. So it's a win, win, win. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and thinking of that, you meant, you mentioned that and, and I don't know if even people that, that grow hemp or are thinking about growing hemp understand the root system. Uh, and I'm going to compare it to corn okay. because corn is like grass and it, you know, and like thinking of your, your lawn, the root system goes in a vertical or a horizontal path, right? It doesn't go vertical. Grasses, corn doesn't go very deep. It goes this way across the top of the ground. Hemp is like a tree. It's got this root system that goes way down by, what, 10, 12, 15 feet maybe or deeper. It's got this heat tap, And then it's got these roots that all coming up go go horizontal but it's got this tap root that goes in so that's good for the soil because like you were saying i mean it, there's there's that benefit uh and there's the benefit to produce the char that you can blend back in i mean there's all these side things that could be done as part of that so in terms of the co-op we're going to stress all those things for the farmer right it's a good rotational crop it you know if you're planting corn great keep planting corn but one year plant hemp, you know, in, in that field, not corn or soybean or whatever. I mean, there's all those benefits and we can help farmers and that bringing all that expertise to the table. Uh, but the idea for us with the co-op is that we're going to create a market day one. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a Eureka biofuels operation over here. Okay. And that's, that's the lead in this as far as I see it. And we do that and we have the ability to do that because we're not having to rely on hemp to be there. You know, that's that's always a failing in these projects uh, when you're talking about bioenergy is that if you have just one crop, one, one feedstock, if you don't have that, you don't have a, a business. With us, we're going to bring these other biomass components in there, whether it's municipal waste or tree waste or chicken carcasses or chicken litter manure or, you know, whatever that is, and also hemp. So we're going to be able to put this thing in operation 
And then here comes the hemp as part of that. I think that's what makes this work. And it's going to give the farmer assurance. So he's going to look over there and over there is that facility. And I'm going to sell my hemp to that those guys over there. And if I'm a member of the co-op, I'm going to get paid a little better than if I'm not. But the added benefit is, is that the co-op is also going to be a partner in and have stock in that operation. And so the, the farmers want to get paid for their crop as a member of the co-op, just like you would in any co-op. But when Eureka goes and sells those hundreds of thousands of barrels of that bio crew that's going to be made from hemp and all these other right in its operation, or it generates electricity or whatever it does with that it, it, on that contract, that farmer is also going to benefit because at the end of the year, there's going to be some profits, hopefully, and there's going to be a percentage of those profits come back to the co-op. And then the co-op is going to decide we're going to divide that among our member farmers and they're going to get a dividend check. And I know being from Kentucky, there was a lot of people that I knew grow, growing up whose families were tobacco farmers. And that meant whether my friend got to go to college or not mm-hmm. as a, a kid growing up on a tobacco farm. So th- this is what I'm thinking about in terms of hemp farmers. This is a cash crop that they can get paid twice for growing and as a dividend and that money can go in the bank for the college fund or whatever. The retirement, whatever it is. That's it. And, and the co-op is going to have, you know, when this thing gets completely stood up, we're going to have financial investment kind of component. So we will advise and manage those dollars for the co-op so they can invest their money for an IRA or an educational IRA or fund or whatever, whatever. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is the idea. This is, I don't like seeing farmers take, being taken advantage of by some of these companies that are in the hemp space and they have been in Kentucky. I know for a certain fact they've been abused. Montana just had the second largest Plaintiff's award, $65 million to four hemp CBD farmers there. So, I mean, not unique to Kentucky. 65 million. Well, kudos to those guys for getting that. Yeah, for getting that. Now, whether they'll ever see a dime of that, I don't know. But it, but it sends the right message. It sure does. And, and I, I want to also make sure, you know, that listeners understand. And we've, of course, had Nick Walters on here before. I get to hang out with Nick frequently. Um that the National Hemp Growers Cooperative, of course, does things that traditional co-ops, agriculture co-ops do, best practices in farming, seed purchasing, retire ben- retirement benefits, crop insurance, you know, selling biomass, drying houses, purchasing equipment, legal representation, marketing crops, lab testing, all, all different types of insurance, financing, all of those things. But in, in addition to that, we're talking about also having markets for the hemp. Now I have, I'm 30 plus years in this movement. It is not that easy running around trying to raise funds for a nonprofit. Uh, There has to be that component, especially now, obviously more than ever, 2018 farm bill, boom, we are a legal agricultural commodity. It is go time for hemp and hemp farmers and delivering on the promise of this emerging industry. And so we need the market, the contracts, but we need the sophistication and the experience of people to negotiate those contracts and navigate those markets in addition to creating that that space for our farmers. And uh, and just the National Hemp Growers Cooperative is, is, again, we need it like the flowers need the rain and the sunshine, Roger. As we come to a close um, here, and I can't wait to have you back on again, is there a question I didn't ask or is there a certain message you want to make sure that the listeners know or hear from you? Yeah, just to understand that what we're talking about here is is the possible. I mean, I think, you know, I think this is possible. This is not unproven technologies. It's not unproven science. We just have to have the force of will politically 
to get into this and get and make it happen. I, you know, I'm I'm always excited when I come upon an elected official that really gets this because some people they don't want to get it. But we just have to rethink how we're managing waste. That's one thing, and commit ourselves to biofuel because this will help rural areas. I mean, this is really a exercise in rural economic development at the end of the day, in my opinion, because what I see and what our company's plan is, is that we're just not going to build one of these facilities. There's going to be a network of these facilities. So we would have these gasification uh, plants uh, dotted all over the country, and we would aggregate that gas for our use at larger fuel facilities. So it's just not a one-off deal. We're just not going to go to Mississippi and build one. We're not going to go to Kentucky and build one. We're not going to go to Washington State and build one uh, to just do that one thing. We want to, there's economies of scale, and we want to get that, and we want to build a market for RNG because at the end of the day, and this is over the horizon, I think once we produce this gas, and this is being done right now, we can take that RNG and produce a clean hydrogen. You know, there's there's ways to produce hydrogen. There's a blue hydrogen, a gray hydrogen, and there's a green hydrogen. Well, blue hydrogen is one is done with electrolysis or whatever. There's a gray hydrogen, which is taking traditional natural gas and producing hydrogen. And then there's green hydrogen. If we're using RNG we can produce green hydrogen, which is high, the best hydrogen because it is not negatively impacting the environment. It's produced in, in, a, in a clean way. And I'm saying all that, not to get into a whole other topic, but I think we're headed long-term to a hydrogen economy. The solution is not lithium-ion batteries and mining the, the uh, look at the pictures. Anybody that advocates for electric vehicles, that that is so far worse than anything that coal, oil, or gas could do to the environment. I mean, it it's great at the end, but you've got a lot of problems with with electric batteries, and and we don't have the base load power in this country to support if everybody and they just don't work in rural areas. I mean, there's lots of reasons I could get. I'm just not a fan of the electric car. But imagine having a hydrogen-based economy uh, where your only byproduct of burning hydrogen is water. You can make hydrogen from, uh, from methane. You can. We just, we're just not quite there yet to do it on a scale that makes it commercially viable, but we're getting there. And so I see this as the long-term plan in my mind for Eureka is right now we're going to produce what we need. And as we need something else, we're going to be in a position to do that. So, so once we get this up and we're generating money and part of that money will be taken to do R&D research and development on how we produce hydrogen and, and how we do that. I mean, that's, that's, that's my personal uh, vision. But, yeah, so that, that's, that's what the takeaway is, is that what we're talking about here is not a short term answer to something, it rethinks how we handle our waste across the board and makes it value, valuable as, a, as an input to do good things. Uh, it cleans up the environment. We're going to put hemp farmers to work uh, and farmers, and we're going to rebuild rural economies, and we're setting the stage for that hydrogen economy that we're starting to hear things about. Oh, goosebumps is all I can tell you on that. This is why I'm in hemp. And we'll do it, Joy. We can do it. I know. I know. It is. As, as the Reverend Jesse Jackson says, keep hope alive. It lives in me. It springs <laughs> eternal. And we, and we hope the good Reverend is doing better because I hear he's, he and his wife have all got COVID. Oy. We hope. We hope they get over that. Oh uh, my I, gosh! I that I didn't know, and and yeah. So I, I read that a few days ago. So let's hope that that he's he's okay. Not a lot I agree with him on, but you gotta like him, man. He's he's a persuader. 
Totally. And and when we say hope springs eternal, the other thing is I wouldn't be in hemp for 30 years if I hadn't gained some traction. Guys, I believe and I'm watching it unfold. If you know, I'm I'm in a I live in a different universe than I lived in 30 years ago. National Hemp Growers Cooperative such an important part of this emerging technology, such an important part, important part of the transformation that the entire planet needs to go to as we as we move away from this limited supply and and more difficult uh, ch- challenge here of fossil fuels is such an important critical role. I'm so honored to be a part of it, Roger. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Can't wait to have you back on. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I think helping the farmer in this country uh, is is a worthwhile cause, and this can help save the family farm. I mean, it really can. It, it, uh, and coming from a boy who was raised on a tobacco farm, I uh, I know. <laughs> All right, Roger. Thank you so much again, brother, for everything that you do. Okay, appreciate you. Thank you. Right back at you.